How many of you, as you read the chapter on tools of maturity and stages of maturity, reflected on your own education and what it was like? I see several nods, a few hands. Is there anyone who would share with us what tool, tool or tools of maturity you feel your schooling, I'm not going to call it education, I'm going to call it schooling, uh, emphasized or focused on? Lorna. Intellect. Intellect. Yeah. Okay, I saw Marcia nodding. Will you share what you felt yours? I put, don't mean to put you on the spot, but I did, huh? <laughs> um, what my thoughts were about. What, what your schooling focused on, which tools of Intellect. maturity? Intellect? Yeah. Trina? I feel very fortunate. I must have had a very progressive grade school because we were very, very balanced. You're younger than I am, too. Very small school in Roseburg, which is not, you know, out there. And we had yoga in my class. Yoga? Oh, my goodness. I had no idea how I worked. Priya, what did you feel? Well, you know, I, I moved almost every year of my life, so I had really different experiences. But by the time I got into a boarding school in, in high school, which was a convent school, incidentally, I really think they focused on everything. I mean, we were really encouraged to be involved in sports. and, and um, But intellect, you know, intellect was probably the main focus. Maybe not the emotions. I don't think they focused on, <laughs> on feeling. I think this is uh, the typical report we get from Western, edu Western education. And Western education doesn't only include um, uh, Europe and the U.S., but many other countries, for example, I'm familiar slightly with India, and the, certainly they have adopted the English form of education very much an intellectual emphasis. And I know the first time that it dawned on me that there was more uh, to education than that and more to uh, learning than that was actually, I was a college graduate. And I had a job working at the Georgia Retardation Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And it was very progressive for the time, early 70s. And, uh, when, you know, every all the public institutions were flush with money about right then. And so they were hiring, this was an, uh, an actual residential facility for children, as they called them then, retarded, and who could not, you know, be at home, couldn't, there weren't the, there weren't, families weren't able to cope or meet their needs. And it was uh, supposedly very enlightened, well it was for, for what had preceded it, in that it wasn't big institutions, it was cottages and a residential campus, and each cottage had 18 or 20 kids, and um, it was sort of like duplexes, and long story short, there were professionals who came during the day, such as nurses, there were schools for those who could go to school uh, with teachers, but they hired the, all this slew of other college graduates, of, which, of whom I was one, who were uh, residential care counselors, and we came in the morning, and if we were on morning shift, we got them up, got them dressed, fed them breakfast, took them to school, or took them to their doctor's appointments. The idea was to have um, people with some education interacting with them all the time. Well, these kids range from profoundly to, these were the terms from the time that day, from profoundly to mildly retarded. And in our co particular cottage, only a handful went to school. Most of them were there all day, and uh, we, were, we provided them with recreational opportunities. We took them on field trips, etc. Some of the kids had no verbal skills whatsoever. And there was one little girl I can uh, name Barbie. I have a photo of her. I'll never forget her. She was about 11 or 12 years old when I came and was 14 when I left. And she was completely nonverbal. And you could not, she had a very strong will. And she was a quite happy person generally. Uh, but when she wasn't getting what she wanted, her, her, both her physical being, she was so strong, she was very wiry and strong, and her uh, will were so powerful that, you know, one person could not force her. It would take two. And you wouldn't want to force a child anyway. But we're talking to simple things like going to eat dinner. And if she was completely happy with the activity that she was in, 
she didn't have the reasoning power that you could say, but the dinner won't be there in another hour and you'll be hungry before you go to bed. That was impossible with her. And so I learned to communicate with her by just, it was, I had never done this, and this just shows how either retarded I was or my schooling or something, but just to let go of all reason and just get into the heart and feel, okay, what is she feeling right now? And can I make a connection with her over what she's doing, connect with her, and then with my eyes appeal to her feelings come with me now, we've got something good to do. And there would be a trust that she would like wherever I was taking her. And it was such, it was so enlightening for me because I, I didn't really know about getting into the heart and communicating through the heart. It was just all brand new to me and I realized there was a whole universe that I didn't know too much about. You know, that I'd heard lip service paid to it, but I hadn't been taught how to do it. And just, I think the Education for Life book puts it so eloquently that um, education focuses so much on transmitting information and even, not just information, but even reasoning, logic, um, um, what do you call it, uh, the thing we really want to teach teachers to teach isn't just a bunch of facts, but... Uh, I can only think of reasoning right now, it'll come to me. Problem solving, thank you. Problem solving, but usually that's taught too from the intellect. And there's too little time spent on how to absorb teaching. How do you absorb it? How do you learn it? How to concentrate? How to be calm enough? How to um, deal with your own emotions so that you can learn to problem solve? Because when you're in fear, can you problem solve? Of course not. I was just really touched by what Mary was sh sharing this morning about in her little um, area of the room where she has the balls and where the kids practice the, the drain technique that we learned because she's teaching them, or not just teaching them, but she's also providing the atmosphere in which they're practicing because telling them won't, won't do any good. She's providing the atmosphere where they're actually practicing techniques that get them into the heart, that calm them down, that enable them to absorb the wonderful activities and um, more than information, the opportunities for creativity and everything else that she's giving them. These are tools that they, kids can take throughout all of life, and they do. I hope maybe Trina will have time this afternoon. She's going to be speaking on the foundation years, but um, maybe she'll have time to share something, uh, an incident with her uh, Will Year's child and he went to school all the way through here and something he shared in a paper when he went out to um, public schools and he had to write a paper on things and all this came out uh, that showed that he had really taken these tools and it's incorporated, it's, it's actually it's just part of these kids being once they've been in this sort of environment where they're taught holistically. Now this is a term that was tossed around. This term was being used when I was graduating from college holistic education, and I remember that just thrilled me to the core. I knew already before I even met Barbie that I, I lacked something, <laughs> that my education and my, uh, uh, that I, I actually, my development lacked something. And I knew that holistic education was what I was really passionately interested in, but I didn't know what that really meant. I don't think many people knew what that really meant. I think it's taken decades for us to, to understand that. I know the first conference I went to, um, a large conference on holistic education, every single, uh, and it was a three-day conference and we were busy from morning to night with keynote speeches and breakout sessions. Every single one was about educating the heart, developing character, t teaching the whole child, incorporating body, and every single one was a lecture in which there was absolutely no participation, no movement, no, it was just a lecture, just like we were still in college except for two. And one of those was a brain gym by Carl Hannaford and one was on music uh, by Don, the guy who created the Mozart effect, copyrighted the Mozart effect term. Can't think of his name right now. Thank you, Don Campbell. But other than that, it was all lectures. Fifteen years passed, and, I, and all that time I hadn't gone to another national conference, and I went to one in um, Asilomar, actually, the coast of California. And 
I could not believe the change. Maybe 30% of the breakout sessions and the keynotes were like that. Yeah. And there were participatory, the key, before the keynote speeches there was music, there was getting up and moving around. And I thought, this is great because it's really, it's not just lip service anymore. We're learning how to do it. So when you think, when you, back then when we thought about holistic education, I think we thought about mind, heart, and sometimes they added in spirit or soul. Mind, heart, and spirit. And so what does that mean exactly? And then later on, I found out more about the Waldorf system. When I was in college, by the way, I heard of Rudolf Steiner, I heard of the Waldorf system, and I just really was fascinated. Every time I saw a reference to it, I thought, I want to learn about that. That's got something in it for me. And do you know, I would go to the card catalog in every library and look him up, no books. I would go to the, you know, back, the, no internet, guys. This is how. <laughs> <laughs> and so the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature, no. I didn't know how, how to find out anything about him. You know, if I'd lived in New York, I would have gone to a, one of the offbeat metaphysical bookstores. But in South Carolina, I did, I was, it was hopeless. And I think, you know, it was my destiny not to find out about it because I probably would have gone somewhere and, and studied that. Um, but their, tech, their philosophy, the Steiner philosophy, the Waldorf approach, is very similar to the education for life. And there are, they don't call them tools of maturity, but they do talk about the stages of development. And they talk about the first six years being physical or body primarily just as we do. So these are the years when the kids are just learning body control and body mastery. And you know that if you've been in the preschool, right? As, as very young children, every, they have to experience everything through the body. They put every single thing you give them in their mouths, don't they? And it's not just a bad habit. It's they need to physically experience the world. And then the next six years, uh, Education for Life and Waldorf also agree are the feeling years and these are the years when the children are it's the opportune time to educate the heart and what that means we'll talk more about but it's the time when feeling becomes so strong it's the time we, t we just heard about the child falling down and oh where does it hurt everywhere and they're just learning one thing a vocabulary for all of their emotions but they're also learning to they have them and to identify them and the subtle differences between, you know, a very young child, it's, it's I'm getting my needs met or I'm not. And then the older they get, it gets more refined. There becomes in jealousy and affection and generosity and selfishness, all of those things start to come in. It's important to know that when we speak of the tool of maturity of feeling and developing feeling in the education for life system, this is defined as calm feeling calm feeling in the heart. So we're talking about um, those feelings that are also the fruits of meditation. Love, peace. It's not talking about um, excitement. It's not talking about jealousy, hatred. Those are um, in this vocabulary and semantically. When we speak of emotions, we're talking about those. When we talk, speak of feeling, we're talking about a calm receptivity of the heart. That, that ability that I was learning as this counselor who knew so little in the Center for Re um, Georgia Retardation Center, that ability to calm my heart enough to become centered enough to feel what an, this child was feeling and be able to respond to her and communicate with her through the eyes, through that totally nonverbal, through that tool. And then the next six years, uh, from 12 to 18, and I want to emphasize all of these are two, it's not zero through six, it's not birth through six, it's two six, through five years old, and then it's six through 11 years old, and then 12 through 17 years old. Now this is where we come to a difference with the Waldorf system, because we in Education for Life say all of these are the will years. Uh, in the Waldorf system, they do have the will years, but I think it's just a couple of years, 12 to 14. I believe that's correct. Um, I don't want to speak for them, but I know it's not the whole, the whole time. And then from 18 to 24, the intellectual years. And so the will years, and you all, all of you, how many of you have ever had a teenager in your home? Okay, you know what I'm talking about then, don't you? And they, they're having to learn to exert, they're trying to exert their willpower on the world. And oftentimes, 
it's a, it, the only way they have to exert it is against something or against you. But they're just practicing doing that. And as you'll hear from Sandy and Priya both this after, the, later on this morning, they're going to talk a little bit about how to harness that willpower and give them chances to use it in positive ways. And then you think of the intellectual years. That's the, the years, you know, the European coffee houses when they would go to university and sit in the coffee houses and discuss, discuss deep in, intellectual issues. And we have coffee houses again, and they're in Starbucks on their computer and discussing the issues. I know that I had one student I taught um, just right before I came to uh, Portland, actually, at Living Wisdom School in California at Nevada City. And she, I thought, was the most, she was very interesting because her two really strong tools of maturity were feeling and uh, will, I would have said. Now, I don't mean that she didn't have a, a very healthy, vital body. I don't mean that she didn't have a good mind. I just mean that these were the tools that I saw her just, she would just soar in. You know, if she had a chance to be in a play or express art or move her body like expressing a, a feeling or, or even an emotion, that was just that was her all over again and she also had a very strong will well when I heard that she was at the University of Cal well I knew she was at the University of California at Santa Cruz but when I heard that she had decided that she was going to major in astrophysics mm -hmm. you could have knocked me over with a feather I thought well what kind of education for life teacher am I because I, d I had no idea that this child this person's preferred tool of maturity preferred modality was intellect, and wouldn't it have to be to study astrophysics? I mean, I puzzled over that for two or three years, I have to tell you. But I also have to tell you that she's living, she's American, she's living in Brazil right now, and she earns a living by uh, telecommuting with Google, but her whole life passion, all her energy and time, is in being a professional dancer. <laughs> so, yes. So I, I wasn't that far wrong. You know, her strong tool of maturity was will. But when she got into the intellectual years, she was so fascinated by the intellectual things that she was learning that she exerted her will to. I'm going to major in astrophysics. This morning, I had your very first thing fill out a form that asked about some preferred tools of um, what some of your own preferences were. So if you, you don't have to look at it because you might be able to remember, but if you want to look at it, do. And the first one was, which activity would you prefer in your leisure time? A board game? Listening to, okay, a board game. What do you think might be the predominant tool you use when you play a board game? Predominant. Intellect. Intellect. Listening to music or watching a musical. What do you think might be the feeling? A sport. That's pretty easy. Body. Uh, and then D, a board game, a sport, or practicing music would be fine if there's an element of competition and possibly winning. Who is that? Will. Will. Okay. So as you look at what you checked for each one, if you checked A three times, perhaps your preferred tool of, of, of uh, maturity. Oh, actually, I got these out of order, didn't I? Three is out of order. So if you checked A with number one and A with number two and with three, um, taking a class that enables you to enter an accelerated learning program, if you chose those three, probably your preferred tool of maturity is intellect. If you chose B, listening to music, playing with someone younger who's not a close friend, or acquiring three different pets and carrying them for, caring for, for them all, Helen, what's your tool of maturity? <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing her because of her two little doggies. <laughs> um, if you chose C, a sport, C, riding a bike, or uh, B, joining a sports team with a great coach, we know that you love the physical. And uh, if you chose D, uh, trying to conquer a challenge, for example, riding the bike a certain dif distance without sitting down or building a Legos tower taller than the last one. Or in the last one, any of the above would be a good challenge. If that is what uh, rings your times, then probably your predominant tool is will. And does everybody have a predominant tool? I kind of think so. I think some people may be so close on two that it's hard to distinguish. 
But um, in my observation with all the time, all the teaching and all the staff I've worked with, I'm able to always see that there are two that sort of predominate. And what I want to emphasize here, it, we're not talking about what you're good at. I remember when we were very, the book very first came out, Education for Life, in 86, and I was teaching the next year a child who um, was very bright. I had her in sixth, fifth or sixth grade. And she loved to read. And I just remember I could feed her all my favorite books, you know, um, Witch of Blackbird Pond and, you know, all those books for that age, the, the Newberry type books. And she would just eat them up and come back and say, oh, that was great. What can I read next? And so I had her classified in my mind as a tool, as, as being her preferred modality was intellect. And then I had her again in ninth grade. I had a seventh, eighth, ninth grade combination. And we let her come because she wanted to be at the school. She wanted, she, she was in this unique situation where she spent a year with one parent in Nevada City and another year on the East Coast with the other parents. So she was back and forth. And so she had just been away and she really wanted to come to our school one more year. And so I said, because she could work independently and I knew I could have her uh, working with someone else for algebra and some other classes, I said, okay, you can be part of the class. Several years had passed, I'd learned a lot. And what I noticed was the first field trip that we went on, and we went down to the river, and we were swimming, and I just, I was watching her because it was so beautiful. She was a 14-year-old girl, and here she was. We were in this, you know, like a little pond swimming hole in the river, and she was jumping up and diving in. And I could just see that she was, the joy was, and energy was flowing through her in a way I had never seen it in her interaction in the water. And I thought, well, that is really interesting. And then I found out she was taking dance lessons and, and, and that she also loved gymnastics. And I thought, hmm, now that is even more interesting. And as I watched her that year, I started to learn that her preferred tool of, mat of maturity was really the body. That just because she was really, really good and really, really smart in intellectual activities, that wasn't what brought her the joy. So when you're trying to evaluate the children in your class, by evaluate is really the wrong word. When you're trying to discern what is their preferred tool, don't so much look at what they're good at, but look at what, it, in what activity the energy just flows through them, joyful energy just flowing. And that, if, when you see that, and say your preferred tool, tool of modality is feeling, and say, there's his will. Start thinking about, do I do enough challenges in my class? Do I give them opportunities to compete against themselves? Because oftentimes, we don't. I know that um, one year I was teaching with um, a co-teacher down at Ananda Village, and he was very much, very well-rounded. I mean, some people are so well-rounded, it's hard to distinguish what is their, only they can tell you where they feel the joy, really. Um, but he was very well-rounded, but still his preferred tools and modality were will and body. He loved to build and manifest things. And we were co-teaching. We added on this big deck to our classroom that year. And so we met halfway into the fall, as we always did, and discussed all the kids in the class and thought about what is their preferred tool. And then we looked at all the activities we did and thought, are we meeting the, everyone's needs? And I know there was one child in the class that we both agreed, very, very bright, very, very athletic, but we both agreed that her tool of act of her preferred modality was feeling. And we realized that we weren't doing enough in that area, and we thought, let's do more art. We need to do more art. It's not either of our, um, we both loved it, but it wasn't the first thing we'd lead with. So let's do more art, and let's, you know, for circle time, let's do some more of the feeling activity thing. So let's do the the tree meditation, which is something that uh, Toby Morehouse came up with. So the kids go out, this, this they could do on that wonderful campus, they go out, they find a tree to climb, they, have, they cannot climb a tree where they can see anyone else, and they have to be alone, they can't climb a tree with anyone, and then they just spend 10 minutes up there in silence. And then we tell them things they can do, but of course we have no control over whether they're doing, they can hug the tree, they can talk to the tree, they can feel the bark, they can look. And it was interesting because at the end of the, um, the year, we had, the, we had had the kids journal every day. Well, not every day, but every week. What was your favorite activity of the week? And 
one of the favorite activities that, that was over everything that year. This is, these are fifth and sixth grade children now. They're getting ready to move into the will years. We did a ropes course. You know what the ropes courses are challenging and you know I'll never forget jumping out of the tree into the tr with the trapeze Whew. and that I mean all of us were affected for weeks with that and so about I mean nine out of eight out of ten children in the class drew the ropes course that was their outstanding event that memory of the year but one little one girl and she wasn't even the girl that we did these activities for I'll never forget she this beautiful piece of art that was just a branch with leaves and this is what she showed for the, the activity her favorite activity of the year and I, we said well what is it she said well it was the tree meditation mm -hmm. and this is a girl who by the way is a horsewoman she loves horses she's grown now married has a horse and I just thought ah oh, just think if we hadn't made the effort to think are we including all the tools of maturity in our teaching she wouldn't have had that experience now we also can use every tool and every modality when we're teaching academics. So for example, when you're teaching math, and I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, and Karen may be going to talk about this, but it'll be a different, oh, going to. <laughs> it'll be a different slant. You, we can't hear things too many times if we're hearing them for the first time, right? So, or if we're nearly learning them. So if you're teaching math, I remember uh, a kindergarten first grade teacher at the village Elizabeth who would have the kids they would get to stand the only time in the classroom they were ever allowed to stand on the chairs was when they would be, do little simple addition problems and she'd give one a problem one and the other a problem and then they'd have to compare the answer and whoever's answer was bigger got to stand on a chair to show it was a higher number so this is using the body because most of what we so much of what we have to teach in school is intellectual isn't it it is to to the mind where They've got to learn to read and write and compute and problem solve and apply their learning and everything. Uh, although the heart certainly enters into those things too. But this is using the body to teach math skills. Feeling. Can you use feeling to teach math? Well, I just thought of one that I don't have to steal your thunder. Um, Karen will be showing us some ways to do that. But I'll show you one that I really like because in fourth, I always taught, mostly taught fourth, fifth, sixth grade. And so when you're teaching um, long division, you can use this one. Uh, I think that's going to work. Okay. It may not work. Anyway. Um, so you're teaching long division at class. Four goes into six how many times? And then what do you do? Okay. And then I was taught you bring down the five. But here's how I teach it. Oh, that two's lonely down there. Is there anybody up here who can come down and play with him? <laughs> yes, we still have a five who can come down and play with him. How many times does four go into 25? Six. Six. And six times four is? Okay, we subtract and what do we get? Oh, he's lonely. Is there anybody else who can come down and play? Yeah, there's the two. Four goes into 12. Three and three times four. You know, when you're teaching, very first teaching long division, they don't give you remainders, so it always works out. <laughs> <laughs> Later, when you can teach them that when somebody's left and they're lonely, they get to go up here and be the remainder and be with the group. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how you can use feeling to teach an intellectual skill. Well, okay class, I'm going to give you four problems. Let's see if you can finish them before break. All right, so challenge those will kids. Or you might have them compete against yourself. See if you can do one more than you did yesterday. All right? And then it, the whole thing is intellectual, so we don't have to, I tell you, we don't have to come up with ways to do that because that's what we've all mostly learned in school and we know how to do that. Yes, uh, Selene. Can I ask you, um, is possible to, is a kid to have to very close to tools, very close. Yes. And you can, you can really, it's not like a one common. Yes. Choice. Absolutely. Well, anything's possible, and I'm not the authority. And the book doesn't ever say that people have one in particular. Mm -hmm. Education for Life doesn't say that. But I, I feel that I, usually, the, sometimes they're too really close. 
Um, yeah, and we can talk more about that when it's not being recorded. We can talk about individuals. I don't want to, it's, you know, there's no, I don't want to have this recorded for posterity about every, uh, my opinion of different people. Okay, okay. But um, okay. let's talk about some people that have, a, 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 the public figures. <coughs> okay, so I think when I'm thinking of body, I think of Lilius Folan. Do you all know her? She was, one, she was teaching yoga back in the early 70s, and she's yeah. still teaching yoga. And she's just absolutely wonderful. But boy, watch one of her videos, and you'll, you'll see feelings right up there, too. You know? And then when I think about um, the feeling tool of maturity and thinking of public figures, I think Maya Angelou. She's on my mind right now being a, a, an African-American poet. And she's been interviewed a lot speaking about uh, the election of Obama. When I think of Will, this might be a little interesting and counterintuitive, and I wouldn't have thought this until I met her. I think of Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Now, I would have thought of her as being totally about feeling and love and taking care of the downtrodden, but um, actually, Vidura and I met her at the same time in 90, oh, you've probably seen her several times, but in 90, I think it's 1990. And she walked in the room, just this teeny, little, teeny little person bent over tiny, but she strode in that room like a soldier with so much energy. And I just could not believe, uh, what I felt from her was dynamic will. And certainly will, attuned to the will of God. Or she, she said she never did anything that Christ didn't tell her to do. But, um, but what did she use that will for? Of course she had to have great will. Look at the work that she started. And then uh, um, intellect. Well, we can think of a lot of people. I think of uh, I have a slideshow where I show pictures of these people. I think of Elaine Pagels, I think is her name, who is a uh, professor at Princeton who is publishing a lot of books on uh, new understanding of Christianity based on texts that they found, <clears throat> you know, ancient texts uh, that are con uh, contemporaneous to the Bible. So, and why did I use all women? Because, um, because always we can, the men are the first people that come to mind. Another um, instance in which I can think of a, a real fun way to look at tools of maturity is Star Wars. How many of you are familiar with the first Star Wars movie? Okay, so think about um, the body. Okay, do you remember Wookiee? <laughs> remember the Wookiee? Okay, think about feeling. Yoda. Think about uh, Will, and I, I say that's Han Solo. You know, he's going to do it, he's going to win, he's going to conquer, he's going to meet every challenge. And intellect, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Did anybody get to read the book Homecoming that I recommended that you read before this class? It's a, uh, Karen. <laughs> reread it. <laughs> we reread it, read it periodically. Uh, it's a book written by Cynthia Voigt, who is a Newbery winner. She won for Dicey's Song, which is a sequel to Homecoming, because she should have won for Homecoming, and the committee the next year made up for it by giving it to her for Dicey's song. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. I read it, it's, it's a little, uh, Sandy thinks it's a little bit harsh for children who are young in the preschool years um, because it's about a family whose uh, father has been long gone and the mother's mentally ill and disappears. And so it's there, and it's about their trek from a shopping center where they're abandoned in, I think, New Jersey to their grandmother's house who lives on the Potomac Bay in Maryland. And it's just, uh, it's a wonderful story and there are four siblings and the oldest one is Dicey and she takes care of the whole family and never lets them give up and finds the grandmother and she is such a wonderful example of, of positively developed will. And then one of the siblings is um, a musician, so she's the feeling. And one of the siblings is brilliant in school and gets scholarships. And, and the fourth one, of course, is the athlete. And I just th think it's so interesting that she has the four siblings, and they each one so beautifully typify a tool of maturity. Um, by the way, just an aside on that, because it's just I love to share these touching stories, is I read that aloud to fifth and sixth graders. And um, what this girl in my class, um, her mother was um, not mentally ill, but not exactly stable. And um, so some years later, when she was like out of high school, but just barely, she was probably 18, um, I was driving in a rural area where I lived toward town, and I saw her hitchhiking. 
And so I picked her up and we were chatting on the way to town and I hadn't seen her in four or five years because they had moved away and I found out that um, she wasn't living with her mother and you know, I'm not sure what all the circumstances were, but she was actually really homeless and living in a tent. And she brought up to me, she said, do you remember that book, Homecoming? And I said, yeah. She said, I love that book. And this was an 18-year-old, of course. Why did she love that book? Because it was an example of someone meeting this kind of incredible tragedy, tragedy and triumphing. Triumph, is that a word, triumphing? Being triumphant <laughs> in the face of it. So, and then that's, that's a, our read-alouds are one way that we bring so much feeling into the classroom, aren't they? And uh, in that regard, when you're choosing read-alouds for the feeling years, it's so important to think not, oh, this, has, this book has a great lesson and it's set in the, pl the area that we're going to study, so I'm going to read it. Well, the most important thing is, what does it say to the heart? That's the first thing you want to lead with. What does it say to the heart? If it engages children's feelings and opens them up and makes them feel vulnerable when they identify with the character, then does it have an uplifting end? Or does it have it at least a, a, an end where there's understanding and, you know, like the book Shiloh. Do you know the book Shiloh, which is a more recent Newbery winner? We're reading that now. You're reading that now. And that's a book about uh, a little boy who adopts what he thinks is an abused animal. Mm -hmm. And he hides it from his father because he knows his father won't let him keep an animal that's not, he uh, steals it from someone who's abusing it, sorry. He steals it and adopts it and takes care of it and has it off from the house because he knows his father will tell him he can't steal a dog, you know, but he feels he's saving it from this abuser. And as the book goes on, it's not so graphic that it's, you know, it's not graphic violence to the dog that would be harmful to a, a child, in my opinion. But you need to read it yourself before you read it to your own kids and see what you think. But one of the things that, one of the understandings he gets during the book was, of course, that this abuser was also abused and that it's, the, the issues are way more complex than he first thought. Um, but it's very uplifting, I think, toward the end. It has a very uplifting ending. Um, so in looking at our own preferred tools of maturity, and one of your homework assignments will be um, to, start to really reflect a lot about that. You know, there's a um, handout that you will be getting when you get your group of handouts to put in your binders that you'll be doing for homework where you'll be looking at identifying your own tool. And why is it so important not only that you identify the tools of maturity in your class so you can be sure you're speaking to those tools for each child and you're, you're understanding the kids better. You can understand when uh, a child just balks at PE and you understand, oh, you know, they just don't like to put energy out in a physical way. It's not, how can I do a baby step to get them there, you know. And for me, it's, it's startling when someone doesn't want to put out energy intellectually. I remember talking to a, a PE teacher once. We were doing something at a, a track meet. And it just happened. This was a PE teacher. There's no correspondence here, okay? But just happened. And, I mean, she was like Miss Dynamic Energy and coordinated and everything. And we were scoring something. And she was doing this cumbersome division. And I said, look, this is base 10. All i got to do is move the decimal over. You don't have to actually divide it by 10, just move the decimal over. And she said, I can't think about that. And she kept on, it was like, she couldn't, because it wasn't her preferred tool of maturity and she was under stress. We were, it was a time thing, we were trying to hurry. She wasn't going to put her energy in into an intellectual vein because it just wasn't comfortable. You know, and I, oh, now I get it, because that's how I am. If you could go out and say, let's play tennis, Usha. Oh, my goodness, don't put me with a ball. I have to react really quickly. Do, oh, let's do yoga, okay? <laughs> that's as physical as I want to get. So it helps us understand the children. It helps us address their needs. But also, and very importantly, knowing ourselves helps us see how we may not have as well-rounded a classroom as we hoped. Another thing about the four tools of maturity, people ask, how does this correspond to um, uh, Gardner's, Howard Gardner's, um, what's the phrase multiple I need? Multiple, multiple intelligences, thank you. Um, the multiple intelligences theory, because public school teachers have known for a long time, this isn't quite right. You know, I see kids who are really, really succeeding and doing well in school, who are really, you know, and they're, they're doing great and they're getting all the praise. And there are all these other kids over here who are just as smart and just as creative in their own way. But because 
it's not mathematical intelligence or it's not verbal intelligence it's not getting they're not getting any recognition for it and so people have jumped on this bandwagon of and it's good it's good it's a, it's in the right direction of seven multiple he started out with seven I think he has eight now if I'm not mistaken the multiple intelligences which are anti, uh, verbal uh, spatial mathematical um, interpersonal and intrapersonal that is relating to others and being able to be self-reflective um, and I forget the other two but and then he's added since then he, he one of his criteria for intelligence is it has to be measurable so he thought there must be a spiritual intelligence and he did do a lot of research on that but he found he couldn't really measure it accurately so he isn't using that one and but he did come up with one called naturalistic intelligence which would be like the Charles Darwin or the, the people who perceive detail and can create categories out of that detail. And he says, you know, that might be the child that knows every, um, every make of car. It might not, it doesn't have to do with nature exactly, uh, but that's one of his newer intelligences. But what I have found is that this, these four tools of maturity are more basic to human nature than those intelligences. And that if you really think about addressing each one and create a curriculum that addresses each one you will automatically be pulling every intelligence and using every intelligence in the classroom Helen you had your hand up a while ago what did you want to uh, well, add I was say, I'm uh, sorry I forgot to call on you right then no um, sometimes when you can't tell easily what the maturity tool is for you many times it's well because um, they seem to be good at everything. Yeah. And so, it's fantastic. Anything else anyone wants to add? Yes, Glenda. I, I found it interesting I, when I went through and answered those, the one you started talking about what, what they reflect. If you would have asked me which one I was, I would have said feeling. I'm very emotional, I'm very empathetic, I'm very nurturing. And I came out A every time. So what does that mean? Well, it's, it's only three questions. Take a look at the six or eight activities you wrote down over the last year that you experienced joy. And think about each of those. Which tool of maturity is predominantly used for each activity? Now, that's not always all that easy because gardening could be feeling or it could be body, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you put working a crossword puzzle, it's pretty it could, it's going to be intellect or will, right? It's, it's still two to choose between. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, but look at those two. And also, it's, this is, if you haven't been thinking about this, it's hard to know right in the beginning. And as I said, you're going to have more sheets, more assignments, and more time to reflect on it. I do remember a staff meeting one time that we had where we were <laughs> all talking about, this was our topic for the, to for the meeting. And so I created this activity where we each put our name at the top of a sheet of paper, and then uh, at the bottom, whoever had that sheet, like I had my own, I would write what I thought my predominant tool was. And then I'd fold it up and pass it to the next teacher. And she'd look at my name. And she'd write just above that without looking what she thought my pre pre preferred tool. She'd fold it up, pass it to the next. So that way we got to write on, each one of us wrote on everybody's. So it was so astounding because we know each other really well we work really closely together over the years you know and so they would come back and you would see there's yours and then six other people said something different <laughs> or more often it was um, you know maybe three people said one thing and three put that and something else too you know but this was the funny part to someone on the staff who's not here so that's why I can tell the story <laughs> that we all put intellect and he put feeling and we had, and the funny thing was, is that he started to argue and come up with all these intellectual, complicated, <laughs> verbal reasons to convince us that his predominant tool was feeling. And we were just laughing. <laughs> so it is hard to know your own. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, and, and this is going to be a month long process of working with these. This is, I don't know how many of you are finding it. Um, Beneficial, I know Sonali said that that was one of the things she liked best about the class, but when you send your journal entries in, and I post them on the website, and you read each other's and you read the insights people are having, I think that helps um, a lot. And there, we will be reflecting about this. Sonali, did you want to add? Well, somebody's hand was up back here. I was just going to say quickly, I, 
when you're looking at um, motivation for those answers, when you look at black and white answers, it sometimes doesn't make any sense. I know my predominant tool is feeling, but when I looked at the answers about the one about riding a bike, I immediately went to riding a bike. And I thought about that, I thought, there's no, it's not because I have any desire to be physical. It's because when I think of riding a bike, I think about being alone and getting away from other people. And my experience of riding a bike when I was little was very much about feeling, about having time away mm -hmm. and um, being in nature and doing things that I wanted to do and having quiet time. So I immediately thought about riding a bike. But, um, so, and I compare that with the kids in my class also, I'll leap to sometimes a conclusion about what I think they're doing, but if I ask them or I look deeper into what their motivation is behind it, there, it often is flips it to a whole Thank you. Thing. That's another way to think of it. Not only is where does the joy flow, but what's the motivation for the activity. Mm -hmm. great, great insight there. Mm -hmm. So before we end and have break, I just want to say two more things, and one is um, just to mention in brief that any of the tools of maturity can be developed, overdeveloped or developed in a negative way. So we've been talking about, you know, positive things. But a person who develops one in isolation uh, to the others, for example, physical skills, um, you know, those are the people, the, the famous athletes that get arrested for outrageous behavior because they're, you know, the, the feeling and the calm, clear intellect haven't been developed in conjunction with that incredible physical skill. Uh, you think about people who are overdeveloped in feeling and not balanced in everything else and sometimes they can be hypochondriacs. They can be, people who are developed in feeling, whose predominant tool is feeling, can be empathetic, compassionate, but they also, if it's turned inward, can be, um, what's the right word, uh, self-centered. It's all about me and how I yes. feel, you know. <laughs> Uh, will, same thing with will. You know, in positive willpower is self is about self mastery. It's about able to being able to use the will to achieve your goals. But when it's negatively developed, and people have the predominant tool of will, it can be developed in a way of trying to force others to do your will, and that's a bully. So that's that's that type of personality. And then the overdeveloped intellect are the people, I'm sure you've all known um, the kind of person uh, who is, we, well, I don't like to use pejoratives because, and, but I'm going to say the word nerd, as it used to be meant, now it's a positive thing. You know, a, a nerd somebody who can handle technology, yes, <laughs> we, come help us. <laughs> but, you know, the person who had the six uh, pins in their pocket but couldn't carry on a conversation and couldn't, uh, establish a relationship and maybe they were actually quite lonely and would love to have but, but everything they can intellectualize about everything they have wonderful ideas but they can't bring it into manifestation on this physical plane so that's that's the reason we want to help children develop them in balance I know we had a family here at our school who had one of the um, most gifted intellectually kids that I remember that we've worked with and it just you know shows all over the place for example he was on national jeopardy and um, he could have been in a, a school that was strictly for the gifted and been being taught algebra when he was in sixth grade but they had him here because they wanted him to have a balanced education and to develop feeling heart will all of those things and and it seems to what, from what I can tell, it seems to, they, and they tell me all the time how grateful they are for this school to give him the right foundation. We have students here now who qualify in, in this way, that the parents have them here because they don't want their child to become so one-sided and to get all their praise for just intellectual development so that they don't develop all parts of their being. Just close with a little story. The same teacher that I was talking about that we did the ropes course with, we did a field trip to um, the coast to a tide pool. We studied oceans and we went to a tide pool. And it was such a gorgeous day and it was my first trip to a tide pool. I had never actually seen starfish and all those things in the wild, only in aquariums. We were all, I mean, you know, in nine-year-olds and ten-year-olds and eleven-year-olds, they're just still fresh, at, le at least out in nature they are. And we were just having the best time and everybody was sort of we didn't have it tightly structured because, of course, in an education for life school, yes, we're going to learn about the structure and the processes and the metabolism of all these animals, etc., before we go and we're going to uh, learn biology. 
But when we're there, we want them to feel, don't we? We want them to enjoy. We want, I was felt so sorry for this group. There was another group there from another school who were sitting on the beach filling out worksheets. And we were all experiencing the life. And I had one little boy who was pointing at all the starfish, and that was the, the animal he had done his report on. And he was telling me every single thing about them, how long they lived, what they lived, what they weighed, everything. He was so excited. Then I had this group run up to me with all these little hermit crabs. Look, look, Usha, what we caught. Look, look, look. And this one's Sammy, and this one's Annabelle, and this one's... <laughs> and then I turned and looked, and... The other teacher and four or five of the kids, <gasps> my heart kind of went, <gasps> because they had climbed one of those big rocks. And it's like, ooh, are they safe? Oh, yeah, they're with him. They're safe. And, I, and then I looked around and I thought, oh, I get it. All the will and physical kids were up there on the rock. <laughs> the intellectual child was telling me everything about the starfish. And the feeling kids were collecting hermit crabs and giving them names. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, this is great because then we can affirm who every child is. I, another thing I remember, we had this child who had some academic difficulties and her mother put her here. And yes, she did have some academic difficulties, but she was one of the most in tune children to people I'd ever seen and to, and to the heart, to feeling. I remember one time when we were decorating the altar and she just came in and just stood at the altar and she was just transfixed by beauty. She just didn't say anything. And she's so into feeling that I don't remember another time. This is a feeling child in the feeling years now. Well, you know, you pull out a picture of a baby animal in front of a class of kids between 6 and 10, and almost all of them will go, aww, because <laughs> they're in the feeling years. Now, if I did that right now, all of you who are in the feeling tool or who've really been loose about expressing it would all go, ah, but many of you wouldn't. And so, but this, I expect children to do that about a baby animal, but... Let me tell you what she did it about. One time I, I took the recycle box, which Karen had lined with blue contact paper and it had a sticker on it, you know, but it wasn't. It wasn't like it was some art piece. <laughs> and and into the recycling and I put it in the office and forgot about it. And then one day I came in, oh, there's the recycle box. So I went to take it back in the classroom and I walked in. This little girl looked up and she said, oh, our recycle box. <laughs> <laughs> And I told her mother, I, and another thing, she, is that she was the one I would ask after school, if I'd seen a parent and I couldn't see them right now, I could say, do you know where so-and-so's mother is? And she'd say, oh yeah, she went over to uh, that other, the intermediate classroom. She was so attuned to everybody. And I told her mother, I said, this child is gifted. And her report card is never going to show it. But she has a gift. And I can think of lots of jobs that she could do that... Um, have to do with people skills that she would surpass anyone who could make straight A's on the standardized test. So the t when we think about the tools of maturity and educating children holistically, what we're talking about really is recognizing their human nature and the way energy flows through them the most free. And then working with it, you want to lead with that with each child because of course they're more willing to take risks in the areas they feel insecure about if they're getting positive encouragement in the areas that come naturally for them. So we want to affirm every child, and we'll talk more about how we encourage children this afternoon, in their, in their uh, natural, easy, uh, preferred, most joyful tool of maturity, while at the same time encouraging them to take steps to be balanced in every tool.
station. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> and you know what, Usha, if you could close that door, I like all the energy to stay in the room. Um, so you have three choices here. Now the goal is, we, I have uh, everyone's scores recorded, so your goal in your category is to get the highest number. So you have three choices. The first is to see if you can build the tallest structure, we count each level as one, that can stand on its own. That's the first. The next, the next one you can choose from is see how many words use a piece of paper and a pencil you can create out of this phrase. Okay. And the last one is you can draw a picture, but you have to, it has to be a picture, and you can see how many colors you can use. You want to use the most number of colors. On your marks, I'm going to set the timer. You will have five minutes to complete this. Actually, four and a half now. Get ready. Go to a station. Find what you would like to do. And you may begin. So how many words we can get out of How many words you can make out of this? Just thanks. Is it okay if I knock the list of over? Is that part of the will here? Sorry, that does not uh, <laughs> comply with the regulations. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know I, it really jumped out at me uh, when I was rereading the, the assignment you were reading in Education for Life that um, I think at some point he says, you know, they have to do things. You know, they have to do things. They can't, you know, they really have to use their bodies. So much happening in their bodies at that time, and all this energy is coming out, and you really have to channel it. <laughs> and uh, that year that I had the four, it was great. Uh, Diva took them one morning a week. And basically, one of the main things he did with them is just wear them out. I mean, he'd just run them. He He'd run them and he'd work them and he'd, you know, just really getting that out. And it was so good for them to just have an outlet for that and, um, and a way to take that energy and move it in a positive direction. Um, they are actually the ones that built the sandbox out there for the younger kids on the playground out there. And they enjoyed doing that. And then they just so enjoyed seeing the younger kids loving it so much. I mean, they could hardly wait to get in that thing when it was done. And every day after that, there were kids in the sandbox. And so that's the other thing is service. Um, service was real, a real important part of that year. Um, showing them that they matter, they can make a difference in a positive way in their world and in their community and in their school. And they were such amazing leaders too. These guys were um, so good with the younger kids. They were, just, they were just really exceptional, I think, all of them. They were all very different, but all of them had big hearts. And a lot of times, one of the things they really enjoyed was doing things for the younger kids, like putting on a little fair for them or, or you know, making things to leave them or making them the sandbox or just going out and playing with them and being the leaders and being the ones that they looked up to. And oftentimes that was, um, that was all it took to really get them back focused again. If we were out on the playground at the same time the younger kids were, and they, we found that they really needed their own playground because their energy was so big that it was intimidating to some of the smaller kids. But all we really had to say was, remember where you are, remember you're being watched, and remember you're, you know, you're big and you can be scary to some of these little guys. And that really brought them right in. They were so good about that and channeling their energy into helping them. Um, the other thing that I think was really helpful was um, they just helping them expand themselves in different ways. And part of that is going places, field trips, you know, just going, you know, doing that. And so um, <laughs> one of the things that I love to do, and every time I say to Usha, I've got an idea or I had a thought. She goes, oh no, where do you want to go now? <laughs> or sometimes just, oh no. <laughs> but, um, 
Usually that means I got something up my sleeve. <laughs> and, uh, and one year, well, back to service. Um, one of the things they like to do every year is they do, we do a food drive uh, for the Oregon Food Bank. And from the first year we started doing this, this is a project that's put on by the food bank to get schools involved. And they have what's called Project Second Wind. It happens in February. It's after the holidays. The food bank's depleted. And so they've got this. It's a competition between schools, basically. And so every school has their own category. So in elementary schools, we participate and they see in this two-week period how many pounds of food you can bring in and they have different categories and for I don't know how many years in a row <laughs> I think all but one that we've done it for six or six years seven years something like that um, we not only took first place in most food per capita but m like five of those years we took most pounds collected period our little school competing with public schools of hundreds of kids and we collected more food than they did and it's because they get into it they have a cause they have a mission they have a you know they get into it and all the parts get in there we have the ones that are coming up with the ideas that are kind of in their head then they have the the artists the feeling ones that draw the posters and you know that we put around or give out and then they're the ones who will like to talk to people and we'll go door to door everywhere in the community or in their neighborhood to ask for the food and then they have the you know the, it just everybody gets involved in whatever way they want it and some of them really like the boxing the food and because we box it up and then we weigh it on our own scale to see how much we have and we keep track of it all and so you know all those different tools get in there and so at that point somehow somebody got wind of us this character education partnership and decided they wanted to give us an, an award and they were going to um, be giving out these awards in Washington, D.C. So I decided we should go accept in person. <laughs> so, <laughs> and um, we did. And, but it took a, a whole fall and summer and um, actually I think we might have started in the spring even. No, I guess it was definitely summer and fall of car washes out here when the farmer's market was out here. We'd charge for parking. We'd wash their car while we're there. And to this day, if you ask any of those boys, <laughs> they'll say, I never want to wash another car. <laughs> but it was great. They were out there, and they were putting their energy out, and they were good and worn out when they were done. <laughs> and, um, and so just giving them something to work toward, giving them a goal, giving them a focus. Um, the um, there was another, at one point I decided, well, you know, they weren't really getting enough exercise, you know, so I kind of tried to give them this challenge, and it, it sort of worked, but it sort of didn't actually work for a number of reasons, but the, the general idea was, um, I was trying to encourage health in them, and so the challenge was, okay, um, I'm going to give you health points. We decided to call them health points. So if they ate a, ate a fresh fruit or vegetable at school, they got a point for each fresh fruit or vegetable they ate. If they, uh, every lap they ran around um, the block, they, they got a health point. And if they did certain things at home, if they were playing sports, like if they played an hour of soccer or this, they got a certain number of points. And if they got to a certain number of points, then I was going to take them on a skiing trip, basically, kind of this, you know, up thing. And, um, so they got going and you know for a while it was really interesting to see which ones of them which ones engaged in that and then which ones didn't so much um, it was interesting they ended up finding a way to get the prize without actually doing the work <laughs> but, <laughs> they got a parent to agree to take them anyway and then it was like well you know so but anyway they were going for a while and they were still going some of them were kind of just into the fact that you know they were doing it and it was the physical child that was really into it he was the one that yeah we're running we're doing this this is cool you know this is great and then um, so they were kind of lagging on their points and I remember there was one person who was uh, one of the four boys was really lagging in his points and I thought okay this is a will child so one day we pulled up to school out from being out somewhere and I pulled into the parking lot and I said okay I'm gonna give you five minutes to do laps and whoever does the most laps I'll double your points and that will child was out of the car and down the street before the other two even knew what hit and and it was really fun to see how it worked out because then the physical child was oh, yeah, this will be fun, we get to run again. And he was in any hurry, he decided to stop at the bathroom on the way. And then the feeling child was, oh good, he'll catch up. 
you know, he was really happy that, oh, good, you know, he's going to have a chance because, you know, he'd kind of gotten behind and didn't know how he was going to catch up. And so, and if the, I remember the fourth boy wasn't there that day, but I, I could guess what he would have done. He would have been right there with him encouraging him because he was a very feeling person too. So it was really fun to see how that manifested in them that way. So um, some of the other things, I want to make sure I get everything that I wrote down here. Um, yeah, challenges and field trips and yeah, the um, service. And the other thing that I think is important, and I know it's mentioned, Karen mentioned it, and in the book it's also mentioned for more of the feeling years, is inspirational people and really um, reading inspiring stories. But I think it's really great for the older kids too, and maybe even a little more... Um, focused or serious way. And so one of the things we did is, is um, I had them read stories about um, people that we were trying to help. For example, one of the service projects we did is they would, we would go down to the Portland Rescue Mission, who, uh, which uh, serves the homeless um, in our community, or in the Portland community, and uh, we um, sorted donations for them and you know that got kind of uh, after a while but <laughs> the parent that was with them found that they'd say okay let's see how many cans we can see if, let's see if we can do this whole pallet of cans in you know five minutes or whatever and of course that got them going then for a while but then we read a book we read a story when it was a fictional story but it was fairly realistic and it was about um, a boy a, a teenager their age who becomes homeless at this point and what happens to his father and how he works through it and he works through it in a real positive way and it comes out that way. Um, we also read stories that incorporated people, um, it's uh, Esperanza Rising I believe was one of the things we read about and, um, and then we looked at the life of Cesar Chavez after that you know because he's a part of that story and uh, the farm workers and uniting them and so you know we used the literature and we used the stories and then we used what we were doing and just tried to connect it all and had it, have it really make sense to them and and then one of the other things I think is really important is to really give them some concrete strategies from someone who knows and one of the things that we read also was um, the seven habits of highly effective teens excellent book. I, I really recommend it. And they loved it. They just thought it was the greatest thing, especially the beginning. Hooked them right in. Even the one that was really a struggling uh, reader did not like to read. I mean, would not read unless he absolutely had to. He got sucked into that book and he couldn't wait. The next morning he'd be coming in, did you read the next chapter? Guess what it says? And he'd be sharing it with them and everything else. And it's really nice because it's written by um, Actually, it's Sean Covey, yeah, it's Stephen Covey's son, and he wrote it as a young child, as a young uh, man for other young men and women, and shares about his experiences. And these are all things that they could identify with because this was someone that was a peer to them. Um, I work with kids in the feeling years. In fact, much of our school here, essentially first grade through sixth grade, is incorporating primarily the feeling years. So from six years old up through 11 years old. And when kids move into the feeling years, you don't forget what they've done in the previous five years of their life. You still reinforce those types of activities daily, multiple times a day. And then you just begin to build on those. And in your handouts, have they gotten these yet? Or are they in their notebook? No, okay. So I'll just mention a few of these things which you have in written form. So, and again, he mentions these in, in the book. One thing that's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity during the feeling years is training the imagination. And there's a bazillion ways to do this. One is by guided visualizations. And one trick with those is to make them as non-specific as possible so that the person who's imagining doesn't feel constrained at any point to match their imagination to what you're saying. Um, any kinds of art, story writing, play, dramatic play, um, it's so popular and also using well, what if, what if this could happen, what if you could do this, what if you could choose. Um, music, movement, dance, drama, those are all wonderful ways to develop the imagination but also to just learn to express feelings. Another area is in developing 
wholesome habits and this again builds totally on the physical years because in the physical years they start all those things about you know wash your hands and all, all those habits of body and mind that you want to then build on and one of the things um, just you know cleanliness talking with the kids and throughout these years you see them develop a lot of skills in that area when they're younger they come in their nose is running they may or may not wipe it with anything appropriate <laughs> or what I consider appropriate if it's my sleeve I don't consider that appropriate but um, washing their hands and not just going in and going Ch -ch -ch, you know it's like and you know we've had we've used music um, a couple of years ago we had uh, we learned a song about wash your hands you know give the soap a spin and if you sing that song and wash your hands during that time then you've got really clean hands and you've gotten rid of your germs um, using manners um, doing blessings for your food to be just to show gratitude uh, habitual things that they can develop during this time that carry them maybe throughout their life and I think another really important habit to help them develop is the habit of high-mindedness of looking for the good things in life um, it's it's such a habit for many people to pick on other people's faults or their own but helping them to look to the best in life or when they're outside using their eyes what they see to look for beauty everywhere to listen for sounds that are pleasing to um, in whatever their experience is as they're taking in sensory information to learn to interpret it in a, a positive way or if they find something that they feel like is disgusting is there something they can do about that so it's kind of building them toward what will be an important element of their lives during the will years developing concentration um, one way in which we do that is you know with the little tone bell that we were just using to gather everyone here is to um, we'll be sitting and play a few notes but then we'll play one final note and everybody's so still that they listen to see who can hear it the longest and the way they show that is they'll have you have them maybe put up their finger or put their finger down when they cease to hear it anymore with their eyes closed so they're not competing with each other I also do that with the uh, auto harp which I was just playing during the um, during the stations and what I'll play a, maybe I'll play a chant or something but then I'll come to the end and I'll just do one chord all the way across usually a C and again we'll listen to see if we can hear it end um, one activity, I don't know if we've talked about this one, I think we have, but maybe we haven't, is um, which Trina kind of, her, her family, her children came up with and introduced to me was having one person lay on the floor and then putting rocks on their body and they see how still they can stay so that no rocks fall off. And it helps them to gain some control with their body, but it's also learning to be still, learning to concentrate developing aspiration and devotion there's so many ways to work with that um, one way that we do and you've some of you've had that experience if not we will be doing it at some point in here is just blessing others learning ways to to share energy in that way learning to identify positive character traits and practice them that actually is the topic of our conscious discipline this afternoon encouragement which is noticing commenting on reinforcing things we notice that are good also falling into this category and wonderful during this age especially in the um, fourth fifth and sixth grade are books about um, heroes and that can be legends it can be true stories about people who are currently living historical figures um, fictional characters it doesn't really matter but um, examples for them and especially it's so good for them to learn that these people didn't spring into this lifetime with all those qualities already developed because it gives them a sense then how did this person become so good at what they did 
and how can I become better at what I'm doing. Um, now, Usha was mentioning earlier about some things that you can do to bring feeling into academics and I wanted to just give you two quick examples. And one of those, um, we were doing, of course we do math every day, and one thing I have noticed that I really appreciate in our little Saxon math lessons for first grade, they're starting to learn about dividing groups in half or thirds or whatever, and they'll have them like draw a dozen cupcakes and then so and so is going to share these equally. Actually, they only share half a dozen with their brothers and with their brother and sister. So they draw three plates and then draw the cupcakes on the plates. But all their um, examples that they do in that way are all about sharing, and I really appreciate that. We were doing an ocean unit this fall, and so one day we were talking about how we do little math stories every day, and they draw a picture and write a number sentence about it, and so. Um, just for fun, I asked each one of them what animals they would like in a math story that I would write for them. So just as an example, how you can, even in a math story, you can have feelings they love sea animals. So, um, a sea otter and a sea lion were playing in the waves. Three dolphins swam over and asked to join in the game. Of course, they were welcomed. How many sea mammals are playing together now? So just a very easy thing to do. Another quick one, and then I'll stop because I know there's lots more to hear about. Um, when we do sorting and fractions, when I'm starting to introduce that, lots of times there's many ways to do things, but you know, we've got, we've got our little buddies here, our little puppies. And so we can have a fraction. It's like, what, what fraction of these little puppies have brown? Or which fraction of the puppies are spotted or which of them have eyebrows that you can see distinctly <laughs> or which of them have fuzzy ears or which of them have long tails <laughs> or you know so it's just it's a really easy way to engage them because of course there's like well can I hold it and their heart is totally well you can see obviously <laughs> me a feeling person no <laughs> my little stuffies. Anyway, so there's just ways to incorporate feeling and to help them develop then their sense of calm feeling in all that they do. Okay, so um, I have to switch from the will now. The will is my comfortable place to be. So um, one of the things that would be great for us to start out with in talking about the physical years would be if everyone were to put your things down and you want to stand up and then, uh, some of you might not have the best knees, hips, joints, so you don't have to do this, but for those of you um, who are physically able, just go ahead and just try to um, stand without using your feet. What that would be like. And so, in our world that we have, would this be a very easy way to live? <laughs> Probably not. You can come back up to your feet. So in the stages of maturity, what we want to look at is when is it the best time to learn how to live within, how to develop those tools that are within us. If you have a, if you have a natural inclination, if, you're, if your tool is the intellect, if you don't take the time during the zero to six, so one, two, three, four, and five, to learn how your body interacts in the physical years, how to be in the physical years, how to recognize what you can do physically to help with your energy, to change it. It would be like living in the world without your feet. So we have to build on that foundation. And uh, one of the things that I love to do with my kids, or the purpose for me at preschool really is for them to learn about themselves and to figure out that they're here right now in their bodies, and that this is their body, and this is where it starts and stops, and where someone else begins. So we do a lot of a uh, lot of different things along those lines. But one of the things that um, we've been learning about recently in our staff training um, is just some of the energy things that you can do, and I incorporate those into my class. And so if everybody right now, and I don't think it's going to work well because I'm going to tap my chest. Is that going to be a problem, Bob? <laughs> I want virtually. All right, so everyone is going to do right here. You're going to actually tap your chest and I want you to take a deep breath through your nose. So right here. 
out through your mouth. We're going to do that again. One more time. Do you feel how you got cleared out? You're all clear. And then right here are some other energy points. You can either rub them. It's right underneath your collarbones there. You can rub or you can tap. And when we come in from outside, a lot of times if our energy, like Usha was talking about, it's not within our bodies. We're not in control of our energy. We do this to help get back in control. Or even this, if we're feeling a little, if things are a little confusing, we do that and it clears out the room. Sometimes we do that if we're cold. Um, we can do these energy points. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do to help them learn what to do when they're not feeling well. And um, another thing that you can do is if everyone is up and about and moving, but you want them to get down to the ground, focus your energy up here. So everybody, hands in the air. All right. And we've been studying the, uh, the water cycle recently. So let's have our fingers be raindrops. And our raindrops are going to fall to the ground very silently. Coming down. And then you can come all the way down until you're sitting and bring your hands down. There, the rain's off. So you can sit down, you can stay down. <laughs> I just wanted you to experience kind of what, some of the things that Melissa and I do in our class. Um, the foundation years is really all about your body and how you're learning um, through, about the world through your body. Okay, through your physical motion, your master, and you're learning to master um, movements. So the large motor skills, you know, we do a lot of these kinds of things and a lot of obstacle courses that we build. We do um, all kinds of uh, opportunities we do, like a, where we can incorporate feeling people, we can incorporate um, the will people. The obstacle course would be what? maybe more of the will people, and you get to use the physical. So for feeling, though, we get to do farm animals. <laughs> we get to do horses, and so everyone gets to be a horse, and we're going to gallop across the playground, or we're going to gallop through the room, or we're giraffes, and we're eating the leaves. Or there's lots and lots of things that you can do in the preschool years to be able to develop this. Then you also want to make sure you're incorporating um, the senses, the five senses. So if you think about... Um, our site. There's a lot you can do with color and that's art that's very easy to do probably to come up with but it's critical that you take the kids outside. They have to go outside because it's the it's the natural light out there not just the nature and all of that but the natural light develops your retinas it has so many more effects that so we always go outside doesn't matter parents have to dress their kids cold, wet, <laughs> everything. Okay so what do we cover? Um, so we do a lot with uh, uh, taste as well. And I bring in different foods for them to try. We talk about the healthy foods that they bring in their lunches. And then I even had one child that he used to bring in, he at the beginning of the school year literally brought in lunches that contained lots of processed foods. <laughs> and he thought his fruit was his <laughs> fruit snacks. <laughs> so, um, so we had talked about it. One of the kids said that they liked that whatever that was, and I said, it's got a lot of sugar in it. It's a little like what candy would be like. And he said, it is? He didn't know. And I said, well, let me just read it. And so I took it. I said, this is what's in it. And I read it, and the first thing was high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> and so he went home, and he told his mom and dad that that wasn't healthy to take in his lunches. And so suddenly his lunches changed, and he was, at that time, he was four years old. And he changed his own lunches. And so he became very aware of what he was eating and putting in his body. There's so many things that you can do during this, this age that if you incorporate your entire um, curriculum around thinking about the physical body, space, senses, then when you develop it, once you get to the feeling years and beyond, you know that if you're feeling down, if you're feeling fear, there are things you can do physically to change how you're feeling. And you can recognize, put words to it, you know, all that. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's how we live in preschool land.